Hi, and welcome to another episode of Haltech Technically Speaking. Today, we're going to have a look at the rotary engine and go through the fueling and ignition required in order to keep your engine happy and healthy for a long time to come. In the performance car scene, you can be described as either a piston or a rotor guy. Personally, I've got great respect for both. Both engine configurations are capable of making huge power and holding their own in the performance racing industry. The three-rotor quarter-mile record currently stands at 619 at 230 mile an hour, while an equivalent piston engine, the six-cylinder 2JZ, stands at 570 at 252 mile an hour. And let's not forget, Mazda won the Le Mans 24-hour endurance race back in 1991 in a rotary-powered car. Despite all that, the rotary engine is often described as unreliable. The truth is, with a quality engine build, programmable engine management, and a good tune, there's no reason why your rotary engine shouldn't last and provide many years of reliable peak performance. The first thing we need to understand is that the rotary engine has half the available processing time of a piston engine. For example, at 6,000 RPM, a piston engine performs a full engine cycle or cam revolution in every 20 milliseconds, whereas a rotary engine performs a full engine cycle in 10 milliseconds. Keep in mind there's a thousand milliseconds in a second, so all this stuff's happening pretty quick. Assuming we're using sequential injection and direct fire ignition, this means at 6,000 RPM, the piston engine's ECU has 20 milliseconds to inject the required amount of fuel for the next cylinder to fire and to charge the ignition coil for the next cylinder to fire. On a rotary engine, you only have half this time, 10 milliseconds. This means we'll require roughly double the fuel system in order to make the same power. Not because the engine makes more or less power, rather, there's only half the time to inject the fuel. Likewise, the ignition system needs to be able to fully charge the ignition coil each engine cycle in order to provide good spark energy. In our example of 6,000 RPM and 10 milliseconds for each engine cycle, most coils will be able to charge sufficiently. However, when we increase the engine RPM, we start to see problems. If we rev the rotary to 9,000 RPM, it'll take 6.6 .6 milliseconds to do a full engine cycle. It's when the revs increase that we need to make sure that the fuel and ignition system are big enough and powerful enough to provide enough spark to the engine and enough fuel to the engine to keep it happy. The rotary engine does not take kindly to ignition misfire or lean out conditions. In summary, if you had a piston engine which required 1000 cc of injectors to make 400 kilowatts, you would need 2000 cc of injectors on a rotary to make the same 400 kilowatts as you need to get the fuel into the engine in half of the time. The rotary engine has leading and trailing spark plugs. The leading plugs are located in the lower rotor housing. They're used to ignite most of the air fuel mixture and provide most of the engine power. The trailing spark plugs are located higher in the rotor housing and are fired 10 to 15 degrees after the leading plugs. They're used to complete combustion and provide a more uniform flame front across the face of the rotor itself. In my experience, the leading plugs will make more than 95% of the power, while the trailings can make less than 5% of the power depending on the engine. The leading ignition timing, this bottom one here, will fire at around 30 to 35 degrees under cruise conditions, down to 15 to 20 degrees at atmospheric pressure, then 10 degrees of ignition timing under boost. Keep in mind this is a vast generalisation and each engine may require slightly different ignition timing. The ignition split timing is the angle the trailing spark plug fires after the leading spark plug. The lower the split timing, the more chance of engine damage occurring. So typically, setting the entire split map to about 10 degrees will yield the most results with the least risk of engine damage. When tuning the ignition map on a dyno, remember that it won't look like a piston engine ignition map. Don't try and chase the power by adding ignition timing as the revs increase. The timing will only increase a few degrees across the entire rev range. Diagnosing an ignition system problem on a rotary can be tricky because if there's a leading plug misfire, 
the trailing plug, this one, will fire 10 degrees after and there won't be a clear misfire, rather a slightly off-song exhaust note that's pretty hard to detect. To make sure your ignition system is performing correctly, you can disable the trailing spark plugs by unplugging their ignition modules and putting the engine under load. A run on the dyno will reveal a sharp ignition misfire if the leading ignition is having a problem and you can expect to lose a few horsepower by having the trailing plugs disconnected. Now that we've got the engine's ignition system under control, we need to take a look at the fueling requirements. Most rotaries will like to idle at an air fuel ratio of around 13.5 to 14 to 1. As the engine approaches atmospheric pressure, a target of around 11 to 1 is desired. On boost, the engine will like an air fuel ratio of about 10.5 to 1. You'll notice that the engine will make similar power with an air fuel ratio of anything from about 10 to 13 to 1. The reason we choose the air fuel ratio of around 10.5 to 1 is to properly lubricate the engine and to thermally manage the combustion temperatures. Finally, the injection angle needs to be tuned. While a piston engine requires an injection angle of around 400 degrees, a rotary engine will benefit most with an injection angle of around 330 degrees at the rev limit and around 270 degrees under cruising conditions. You'll know if the injection angle is incorrect because the engine power will roll over as you reach the rev limiter. Assuming that everything attached to the engine is sized correctly, the power curve should come up to full power and hold close to this power until the rev limiter. It's important to get this right as there's potential to lose big power high in the rev range. And now for the disclaimer. Please keep in mind that everything I've been over in this video is a generalization in order to give you a better idea of how your engine works and what it wants. I'm sure there's many exceptions in many different cases and I'll certainly be looking for them in the comments below. My name's Scott and as always, thanks very much for watching. Hi guys, it's Scott here. We've been doing a bunch of videos lately with this shirt on. A lot of people have been asking where to get it from. The Haltech online store. Jump on, you'll be able to grab it in your size and then you never know, the next fancy dress you go to, you go as me, Scott from Haltech. <laughs>